So today we're going to talk about kinetics. And this is going to be one of a multi-part uh, video lecture. And you can find the other videos on YouTube as well. But today we're really going to start with just the introduction. So to begin with, what I want to do is just show you a short film to help you understand what I mean when I say kinetics. To define it means the rate at which chemical change happens. And you can imagine the many applications with industry where you need to actually be in charge of how fast something happens. Because time is usually money. All right, what we're going to do is a little demonstration. We're going to put equal amount of uh, water in each one of these, five mils. Then we're going to add the uh, crystal violet, which I have in this beaker. I'm going to add different concentrations, one drop, two drops, two drops, one drop. Stir those up. Now what I want to do is I want to add a concentrated sodium hydroxide to one side. And a dilute sodium hydroxide to the other side. So that's one molar. And on this side I'm going to add a half molar sodium hydroxide. So here's my notation. That's a one, two drops, two drops, one. Now on this side I'm going to add 0.5 molar. On this side I'm going to add 1 molar. And I'm going to add the exact same amounts to each. I'm going to add 4 mils. 4 mils of 1 molar to this. And 4 mils of a half molar to this side. So we're going to get our white background in place. Start my clock so you can kind of see how the timing's running. Here comes the one molar sodium hydroxide, four mils to each side. And here comes the half molar in the 22nd mark, roughly. Away we go. Starting at the 52nd mark, I'm going to use time-lapse photography to show the color change at every 20-second interval. As early as two minutes, you can see that one drop, one molar is already clear. At three minutes, the two drops, one molar is clear. At five minutes, the one drop, half molar is clear. At 6.20, the two drop half molar is finally clear as well. So the take home here is that there's a pattern. It's not linear, it's not a simple pattern, but somehow there's a relationship between the concentration of the reagents and the rate at which the reaction happens. And we'll ferret that out in the, in the videos that follow and get the exact math figured out. But first we need to just understand the kinetics from a molecular point of view to understand mm -hmm. that factors that control the rate at which reactions happen. So now that you've seen this reaction, I'm going to show you this reaction basically with, with chemical structures. So what we did in the lab is we took uh, crystal violet, which is a purple substance, and it actually is um, a unique, it's called a carbocation, it's a unique structure, but that carbocation has an attraction for the uh, negative hydroxide ion. 
And so it's a, it's a single attack. And so that the, the electrons on the hydroxide form a covalent bond. You basically form this alcohol product. And sodium chloride is the byproduct, and that should be remain soluble in the solution. This particular material is actually clear, and this absorbs all the colors except for purple, so you see purple when you look at it. So let's talk about the rate, how fast a reaction occurs depending on A reacting with B to make AB. So basically A reacting with B to make this new compound AB. So here's a molecular structure of um, crystal violet and I, I have it rotating so you can appreciate the complexity and, and if it's going fairly fast but that central carbon, that's the carbocation, it's a it's kind of flat, uh, it has three things connected to it, and that's where the hydroxide attacks. So if you look at this reaction here with the chemical uh, symbols, as opposed to here with molecular space, here's the before, this thing kind of lays flat, and here's the after, after the hydroxide's attack. Now it's back to more of a tetrahedral carbon. So you can look at this, um, product and see that it's no longer kind of, this is fairly planar in the middle. This is a tetrahedron. So now I'm going to take that alcohol product and start rotating it around so you kind of get appreciation of the geometry. So those arms that before were fairly flat, now they're kind of bent back. And the hydroxide is on the other side and all these angles are about 109.5. So let's walk through the progress of the reaction with the molecular symbol. So Here's my hydroxide ion, and it's going to attack the carbon that's kind of centered in here. So there it goes, it makes the attack. And as it starts to attack, then this thing's going to have to start bending back to make room. These arms kind of bend back. And when the bond is formed, you basically have this tetrahedral configuration. So how fast does that happen? What has to be in place to make this happen and what can make it happen faster? That's what kinetics is all about. So let's, let's what increases the probability that a red hydroxide will find the retro, uh, central carbon? Um, how will this happen faster? Now I've just simplified down. Instead of showing the OH, I've just put just the oxygen atom just to simplify things. And in some of these figures, you're going to see a chlorine in there. Um, that, that isn't covalently bound in this particular structure. I've just got it attached uh, just to keep it in place, but that, that's an ionic bond. That's, that is not a true covalent bond. In crystal violet, we'll talk about something that is a covalently bound later on. But let's just talk about how can we make this happen faster. The probability that this red finds that carbon and finds it in the right orientation. It has to come into the right orientation and it has to be going with enough energy because the energy of both these molecules is such that it actually makes this whole structure invert and it gets within the uh, covalent radius so that a new bond is formed. So that's a lot of important factors. So one of the things is you can imagine that one thing that could increase the odds of that happen faster is you heat it up. So relative to going slow, you could increase the temperature and it will just go faster because remember increasing the temperature is increasing the kinetic energy. So what's another way that you could increase the probability of this red finding that center uh, carbon from the right orientation? You could double the amount of reds present or triple them, quadruple them or five times more of these reds present than Obviously, the odds are going to be very high that one of those is going to find that in the right orientation. So increasing concentration will also increase the, the rate at which a reaction happens. The third thing is, and this really applies to if it's a gas. In this particular case, it really isn't. But you can understand the concept. Look, if I have this uh, gas it, within this con confined space or volume, right, what would happen the probability of finding that at a given temperature versus constricting the volume, i.e. increasing the pressure, right? Wouldn't the probability that be higher 
the more constricted the space becomes. So that, that really only applies to um, a gas. And in essence, that's the same thing as increasing concentration. So what's another way to increase the probability of that finding that? There's other ways to increase the energy. We talked about thermal energy, which is going to make this thing travel faster. But the idea is that I've got to get this within the covalent radius. It's got to get to the right close enough. And remember, these are usually these are electronics, so they're usually repulsed by the electrons in all these atoms. So the atom has to have enough energy to get in there. There also has to be enough energy to undergo inversion. So that's the second part of this. Okay? But thermal energy is not the only way to increase energy. You can pick other ways, other sources of energy. You know, light, microwaves, x-rays, sound, anything that will increase the energy of these two molecules could possibly create the right uh, situation for this to go faster. So I don't want you to just be stuck on thermal, but in this class we'll predominantly talk about thermal energy. So complexity is the other factor. So I took this um, crystal violet and you could make it a little bit more complex by just putting extra methyl groups off the end of this. This is sometimes called ethyl violet. So how would that affect things? Well, the thing to consider is that these arms are free to rotate. Okay, they can rotate around these single bonds. So they're, they're almost like little, little blockers. And the longer this chain gets, and especially if it's a single bond so they can rotate freely, the more likely you're going to have um, something blocking that central carbon. So you can imagine that complexity is also another factor. Because now all of a sudden, not only do you have this molecule moving, you also have these arms moving in and out of the way. So this molecule might find it harder and harder to find that central carbon. Okay, here's another example. Um, this is be a reaction where we're basically rusting iron. Okay, and you know that if, if there's very little surface area, oxygen can find iron, and it can go through this reaction and turn into iron 3 oxide. So in the second example, we drop a high surface area iron wool down into a bottle that's filled with oxygen. And because of the high surface area of the iron wool, it, it spontaneously ignites in this rusting reaction with a lot of heat released. Okay, so here's another reaction. We're going to take an acid. We're going to react it with carbonate. And an acid in the presence of carbonate, as we remember, makes a salt, a carbon dioxide, gas, and water. Get all my um, balanced equation here. But there's different ways to add the sodium carbonate. You could add it as a chunk or a solid. Or you could pre-dissolve sodium carbonate in water because once again it's really the carbonate ions that are interacting with this acid and when that happens the carbonate ions interact and they free up CO2 in water. So right here you can imagine only the molecules along the surface are able to act while, while as here you already have carbonate disassociated, so it's high surface area. So this is back to the pre prior slide, but another way of saying this is state determines the rate. And here's another way we could amp this up even more. What if instead of um, reacting this with um, acetic acid that's already dissolved, let's take it and make it acetic acid that's gaseous, so it's, it's highly um, of super high surface area, and then pumping that through the water. So you might even increase the re reaction rate even more. So um, we're going to talk about this in the next film, but the long story short is this. The rate of reacting um, gases versus aqueous versus solid usually tends to sit in this trend. And it really is based on surface area, but it also is based on temperature, because usually if you're in the gaseous state, you're at already at a higher temperature. So here's what we've got. Temperature can affect rate, concentration, pressure, other sources of energy besides heat and temperature. And you'll notice on here I starred both of these the same because remember, if you're adding pressure to a gas, it's like increasing the concentration. 
the complexity of the uh, reagents, the surface area of the reagents, and the state of the reagents. And once again, when we talked about the state, we realized that by changing the state, you're changing the surface area, and a lot of times you're also changing the temperature. But I'm going to highlight two of these and point out these end up in almost every uh, kinetics equation, temperature and concentration. And I'll show you that when we get to the formulas in the next few videos. So I'd like to now show you a reaction graph, uh, the progress of the reaction, just to help you understand kinetics and kind of lay some groundwork for how we're going to understand kinetics. So on, on this axis, the y-axis, we're going to plot energy. We're going to go up increasing energy and down decreasing energy. And here we're just basically running the time of the reaction. And as we do that, as we run left to right, we're going to start with the reactants. Okay? In, the, in our uh, reactions we saw in the video, it was a base, hydroxide, interacting with this crystal violet. If the energy is right, the temperature is right, it goes to this higher energy transition state. And what's going on in that transition state? Well, remember, the arms kind of have to bend back. The hydroxide has to start forming a bond. We're usually not able to isolate this chemical structure and it is referred to as the transition state. And finally, you end up at your products. And this is the, the, um, the alcohol, the final alcohol that's formed. So as you graph this out, you'll start at reactants. You'll flow into the transition state, which is this non-isolatable uh, chemical structure. And then finally, you'll end up at products. This is called the activation energy, and the size of the activation energy is pump is directly related to how fast reaction happens. This is the minimal temperature that would be necessary to have the energy to achieve this reaction. That energy you always get back out on the way down, and then what you measure the difference between reactants and products is not uh, what we classically call kinetics, that's thermodynamics. That will tell you how much energy is released from the reaction. This, this particular one's exothermic. But if you started at products and you ran this reaction in, in reverse, this is the activation energy to run it in reverse. This is the hump you'd have to get over to get to the transition state and get back to your reactants. And remember, activation energy is the measure of the energy that's needed to make the reaction uh, occur, and it is directly related to the rate. So just for comparison, here's an endothermic reaction. Different reaction, but basically you have to go apply enough activation energy to get through a transition state and get to the products. You have to pump energy into this reaction to make it occur. This is endothermic. And this really has no bearing, this, whether it's endothermic or exothermic, uh, directly on the rate. But the height of the activation energy barrier is what determines the rate. So I hope that this video has helped you understand the beginnings of kinetics and have an idea about some really uh, important factors that will affect the rate of a reaction and also to understand how a reaction diagram works and some of the features of a reaction diagram and how they pertain to kinetics.